Grant and Dawn and their daughter Carly have all become outspoken advocates. Actually, we sort of consider them one of our shining stars of the regenerative agriculture movement. I don't know if, if anyone remembers the old Barbara Mandrell country hit, I was country when country wasn't cool. That's sort of how I feel about the way I grew up. At least 90% of what we ate every day came from the farm. But my education told me that, no, we weren't doing things right. Suddenly, all of the things that we didn't seem to need when I was growing up, like the antibiotics and, and a lot of the farm chemicals and, and the livestock pharmaceuticals and, and feed supplements, all of a sudden became very important. And I was convinced that if we were going to keep up with the times, we had to have that. And over the years, what I discovered was that we were having more and more problems not less, that in spite of all the research we were doing, in spite of all the new pharmaceuticals, all the new antibiotics, all the new supplements, all the new ag chemicals and fertilizers, things were not going well. Instead of solving the problem, what we were really doing was just constantly putting band-aids on what I now understand as a gushing wound. Farmers have the highest rate of suicide of any profession in the U.S. Their quality of life has diminished to the point that many of them hate what they have to do every day. I've never enjoyed mixing up a spray recipe of any kind. I've never enjoyed sitting in a sprayer. I've never enjoyed dealing with those chemicals with all the protective gear on. Farmers are finding that it's harder and harder for them to, to make a living, to maintain equity, and to have a viable business that they can pass down to their kids and their grandkids. And a huge part of that is the need for these annual operating loans that keep them heavily in debt. The current farm bill has got us to where we are right now. We have to financially produce the crops that we can ensure for the most profit. So that took a lot of the diversity out of our egg profile. The thing they're most afraid of is that they're gonna be the generation that failed and lost the farm. I knew that if we didn't do something, we were going to see a significant collapse in the existence of this family farm heritage and that multi-generational tradition. I was born and raised here. I'm the fourth generation on this farm, and I just had the fifth. Um, I've been here my entire life and had no ambition to go anywhere else. What we're doing here is setting our property up for my kids and my grandkids to farm it because the biggest thing that I've ever learned is we never own this land. We simply run from the next generation. The beautiful thing about regenerative agriculture is that we can immediately begin implementing practices that are not going to cost the farmer, but are actually going to relieve financial burdens, particularly input burdens, and are going to increase their productivity in year one. It's very hard to hold a conversation with another farmer because we don't have that much in common anymore. And we know that we're talked about in the coffee shops and in the elevators and, and stuff like that, and because we hear about it. 
and it doesn't bother us anymore. At first it was kind of lonely and it, it, it bothered us, but now it doesn't because the benefits of what we do here and what we're seeing and ultimately the bottom line far outweigh what people are saying about us. So it's, it's okay. And this is what we're doing is becoming slowly but surely a little bit more accepted. We went back to farming the way my dad's grandpa farmed, and to me that's pretty cool. I've always felt like I was born into the wrong generation because I thought the way they were farming was pretty cool, and now we get to do it. Grant and Dawn bright Crutes are a wonderful story. One of the first things we did was we changed that monoculture cover crop into a highly complex, diverse cover crop and that immediately became a game changer for them. Overnight they went from having cover crop failures to having cover crop success. They have made an absolute complete turnaround in not only their production practices but more importantly their their mindset. Hopefully it's not pink. That pink is our problem. What is that problem? That's the seed treatment. 99.8% of corn is treated is with treated that treatment. With treated seed. I'm pretty well convinced we don't need the treatment anymore. I mean, you look at what we got here, you know, with all these earthworms. I think we're done with that. Good. <laughs> that makes me happy. <laughs> the neat part is, is that 118-year-old seed company up the river here will provide us all the seed corn we need without that treatment. The consumer is driving the bus here. You know, they're, they're demanding more of this, and so it's becoming more popular, and they're looking for it more frequently, and people like us need to be able to meet that demand. My goal is within five years to have a storefront here on the farm. Um, I love having people out here to see what we're doing. I'm planning on going to a lot of farmers markets with the wagon and we're using social media to market beef. I'm hoping that that'll broaden our consumer base. their ability to be able to think about what they really need to be doing on their farm and how they need to be operating it. Uh, they have built significantly new soil, which conventional wisdom says no way you can build what they have built in the years that they have built it. And they have completely turned around their financial position, not just from a production standpoint, but also from a profitability standpoint. Not only is, is that food, you know, really, really good for you, but the pride in, in how, where that comes from is, is really awesome. In 2019 and 2020, 50 plus percent of all farmers in the U.S. are at significant risk for being able to get their annual operating loans renewed. And, and yet Grant and Dawn have provided a clear example of how to be able to feasibly step your way out of that situation and, and to be able to relieve both the financial pressure and the mental pressure. The first 12 rows of corn that we have in this section of corn here is the first corn that we've planted without any commercial fertilizer applied at all and so far we cannot see Anything on the plant health that shows that we're missing any nutrients on it at all. So far, time will tell, but yeah. we had to try it. Yield, the yield will be the yield will be the indicator. indicator, so. The average farmer farming conventionally is losing between three and four tons of topsoil per acre annually. Now, let's think about that. That's, that's untenable, and that's absolutely unsustainable. When you can get to 60 to 70 earthworms per square foot, you've kind of got 
your soil health fixed and, and we are we are very close if not over that amount. This was the 25 acres that we treated as just a corn soybean rotation with no cover crops. So last year we cover cropped it to fix it. We fixed it in one year. The model that we were using when we started wasn't fun. No. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, we were only doing one thing. We were producing bushels. That's all it was, and it was a race to see who could produce the most bushels. And yet, you, when you had to go answer the bank or everybody else, it's not there financially. Mm -hmm. Now it's fun. Yeah. I mean, it's fun. What what could be yeah. better than going out at 5 o'clock in the morning and riding through all this wildlife? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. 20 years ago, we couldn't have put together 10 people in a room, but yet the number of people that are interested in regenerative practices and adaptive practices is growing very rapidly. When we met Dr. Zach Bush and started talking with him about what he had discovered and what he had uncovered, it really was a huge aha moment. Between 1996 and 2007, there was a complete reversal of our cancer map in the United States. To see an entire population respond in a single decade to a sudden explosion of cancer suggests that we did something similar to Chernobyl. We did some massive environmental injury that led to this explosive rise in cancer. And so we started you know, looking into this understanding of glyphosate as an antibiotic. Glyphosate became a commodity in farming in 1996. Before that, it was used as a weed killer by homeowners and farmers alike, and it had to be used sparingly because it kills everything it touches. That was the history of, of this glyphosate Roundup chemical until 1996, and suddenly it became a crop treatment that actually functions as an antibiotic, killing the, the bacteria and the fungi, the plants, killing all of that life, and it's incredibly a water-soluble toxin, which means it can be carried. And so we took the glyphosate spraying maps, but interestingly, they don't superimpose on our cancer death maps until you pull in the tributaries of the Mississippi River and you suddenly realize that we're collecting some 80, 85% of all the glyphosate sprayed in the United States into a single water system. And if this is the most prevalent antibiotic in our environment that's decimating the microbiome in the soils, we had maybe a, a smoking gun. Maybe this is the event that, that really transformed public health. These degraded soils are not capable of producing highly nutrient-dense food. So the very foods that we're producing out of these soils now that are heavily degraded, they're deficient in the nutrients that we really need to properly feed our bodies and creating significant disease issues and neurological disorders and other illnesses that have degraded our health. Yeah. You think your great grandfather had seven chemicals sitting there killing everything in the well, soil? That's a, that's There's true. There's no way that was the case, yeah. else you would not have inherited a farm. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking at the end of this family farm tradition, and as they collapse, we open ourselves up to vulnerability because it's these multinational organizations that move in with money from China and South America, Russia, all over the world coming in to buy up massive swaths of the most fertile areas and they're owning our own land. No longer owned by Americans, let alone the farmers themselves. It makes absolutely no sense from any stance of homeland security or national safety, national independence. And if we look at this ever-expanding dependence and machine of mega farming scale, we become very prone to catastrophic failures of the delivery system. In the last month, we've had 18 million pounds of beef recalled through two different events because of E. coli and salmonella, these invasive bacteria that are a symptom of a collapse of the greater microbiome of those cows. 
It takes a mega industry to screw up that big, to make us that vulnerable. And so as the scale grows of the farm, we should not be deluded that that means safety. It means danger. It means an extreme dependence on an extremely tenuous situation. We have an opportunity, though, to overcome the fear. And I see that happening on these farms. Something like Grant and Don here reclaiming their right to grow, their right to transform, not just their crops and their soil, but themselves into independent, strong-minded, free people. There's a lot more people out there like us. And in our travels, we've gotten to meet a lot of them. And they're some of the most compassionate, giving, faithful, strong people I've ever met. <clears throat> we all have soft hearts, but it just, it just makes you keep going. Nobody knows better than a good farmer that we are simply the tip of the iceberg of biology when it comes to life on planet Earth. A farmer knows that their cattle, their livestock, their plants have an interdependence deep into the soil. It just seemed like we were fighting and fighting more and more often with Mother Nature. Mother Nature always wins. I don't care if it's in our livestock side of the operation or the grain side of it. And when we decided to finally start trying to work with Mother Nature is when things started working so much better out here. I cannot turn the tide in my clinics. I can't shift the momentum by working with one cancer patient at a time. It's far too slow, and it's not at the root of the cause. And so I look to these farmers to realize the salvation of human health. For Zach to reveal to us what he has seen and noticed in the medical profession, and for us to be able to reveal to Zach what we have seen on the actual food production side, and then when, you, when those two things meet in the middle, it begins to paint a picture that is pretty clear, but also very concerning. And it tells us that if we're going to turn around our own health and the health of our children and our grandchildren, we've got to start now.